Hello everyone, Ludum Dare 51 is right around the corner, and I wanted to share with you that I've open sourced a small add-on library that you can use for your Godot engine game development. These add-ons should make your development experience a lot easier and help you crank out those jam games a little bit quicker, or speed up the development of your more long-term projects. In this video, I'm going to go over how to use each of these add-ons, so stick around for that. But before I get into that, you can check the links in the description below to go right to this repository. It's MIT licensed. Everything is completely free to use. So feel free to add, modify, remove things as you see fit. And of course, if you have any changes that you'd like to see, you can always open up a PR and contribute that back against the main repository. So let's get into what each add-on does. Firstly, here's the repository. There is a short readme here that admittedly is not very descriptive, but it gets you started with the repository. You're going to want to download or check out that repository and then put it in an add-ons folder in your Godot engine project. So you can see here, I've got my three add-ons, center pivot offset, node library, and retile. You also want to go to your project, project settings, go to your plugins, and make sure all of those are enabled. Okay, so let's start with center pivot offset. So what center pivot offset does is it centers the pivot offset of any control node. So I've set up a control node here and you can see that my pivot offset down here is zero, zero. Now, why is centering the pivot offset important? Because when I go to edit something like the scale, what will happen is that it will collapse towards the top left corner because that's where my pivot offset is. This is not going to be desirable, especially when you're trying to animate the scale with something like an animation player. So with this add-on enabled, I can click this button up here called Center Pivot Offset. And that will put the pivot offset right in the middle of the rectangle. And now when I use the scale, you can see that it's scaling about the center of the rectangle instead. And that creates much nicer behavior for things like animating. Do be aware that this won't be useful in the case where your control node is a child of a container element because containers automatically resize their children. Okay, the next add-on that I'm gonna cover is called Retile and Retile simply allows you to reapply auto tiling to a selected tile set. So what I have here is I'm using a tile set from my existing game. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna disable auto tile and I'm just gonna paint and create a big mess here. Okay, now you can see up at the top here, there's a button called retile. If I select my tile map and then click retile, that reapplies the auto tiling with all of the bitmask rules that you've configured. So this is very useful if you add or change bitmasks in your tile set, but it's also useful for randomizing any tiles that you might have set with a priority. So even with the auto tile being configured correctly right here with the tile map, if I click retile, you can see that it's randomizing the floor tiles. So I can actually click this button a few times to get a random layout or a random set of tiles that I particularly like. One caveat with this is that it reapplies auto tiling to the entire tile map. So if I intentionally remove these tiles and want them to remain empty, and then I click retile, it's going to overwrite that. Just be aware of that, that auto tiling is gonna be applied to the entirety of the tile map. And finally, the last add-on in this add-on library that I need to cover is the node library. You can go ahead and get to the example project by clicking the link in the readme here, and that will bring you to a little test project that I've made utilizing the node library. There are a bunch of interesting and useful nodes in this library. To start, I'm gonna cover the Shaky Camera 2D. What the Shaky Camera 2D does is it allows you to specify a shaky camera with some open simplex noise for smooth random. So you can define an open simplex noise with whatever seed you want. So I can open this up here and choose whatever settings I like. And then I can also change the max offset of the camera, the decay and the frequency. You can open up the script and see what's happening under the hood here. But basically what this does is when you call this shake function, with a percentage, it will start shaking the camera in accordance with the parameters that you've configured. So if I run my project here and I click shake shaky camera, you can see that that's applying a really nice screen shake. Also for debugging purposes, you can click the visualize checkbox here and that will actually show you what your open simplex noise looks like in texture form. 
Okay, so the next node is the random audio stream player. The random audio stream player can do a couple of things. It can play any number of random audio streams and it can randomize the pitch each time it plays one of those streams. So I've got it here and I've selected randomized pitch with a pitch minimum and a pitch maximum. These are the default values. And what I can do to configure the streams that I can play is I can go and drag in some of my audio. So I'm gonna drag in the first three robot droid beeps in here onto that streams array. And you can see that it automatically adds nodes in accordance with what you've dragged over. And I can also delete individual elements here and that is updated in real time. The reason that it adds nodes here is so that it can play multiple stream players at the same time without cutting any currently playing streams off. So let's take a look at this script here. And the way that you can use this is you can call the play function and that will choose a random sound that is not currently playing. And then you can use the function play times to play two or three or any number of streams that you want to play simultaneously. This in combination with the random pitch allows you to play the same type of sound multiple times in a row or repeatedly without it sounding too repetitive. So let's go ahead and run the project and see what that sounds like. So you can notice that I've just clicked that button a bunch of times and sorry for how shrill those sounds are, but each time I pressed it, the sound sounded slightly different. And that's because I'm using three variations of the sound, randomizing the pitch, and sometimes I'm overlaying multiple sounds on top of each other by clicking the button twice in close succession. It's a really nice way to get a lot of variety out of very few sound samples. I'm not gonna go into too much depth on the next one, which is the random audio stream player 2D. The important thing to know is that it behaves exactly the same as the random audio stream player, except with audio stream player 2D. 2D nodes, which allows you to set an attenuation and a max distance. What I should mention though, is that when these children are present in the scene tree, you can edit whatever properties you want in here. So I can change the max distance here if I want for this stream player. I can change the attenuation and I can change the bus. I can change any of these settings because those settings are preserved even when I start deleting elements. So the fifth element right here, the fifth stream, will still remain configured even when I delete the first one out of the array. You can see that my max distance and my stream and my bus is still set correctly currently. So feel free to modify the child nodes as you see fit, except I would recommend against deleting the nodes manually here. You should always manipulate what streams are configured with the streams array right here. Let's go ahead and play that just for good measure. And the white box represents where the sound is being played from. Okay, next up we have the random timer. The random timer is very straightforward. It can be configured with a minimum wait time and a maximum wait time. And whenever you call start on the random timer, it chooses a wait time between these numbers and then runs. So this is great for, for example, varying up boss attacks or enemy attacks, things of that nature. The other thing to mention is that if you enable auto start, it will choose a random time in accordance with the configuration and then start the timer. So you can safely use auto start if you just need one off random amount of time. One thing to note is that if you don't have one shot on, so it's unchecked here, it will not generate a new wait time every time the timer runs out. So if you want to have a continuously looping but always changing timer, then you should manually handle that with the timeout signal. So this timer can be used exactly the same as a normal timer. You can use the timeout signal and all that good stuff. So let's go ahead and click the button. So it shows a time of 4.2 seconds to start. If I click it again, it went a little bit higher. Now it was one, so you can Go ahead and open up this project and see that it is working as expected whenever you click the button. And the final node in the node library add-on is the screen transition. So this one is a little bit different. It actually requires that you have an auto load node in your auto loads. So you can do this easily by going to project, project settings, going to the general tab, scrolling all the way down to the add-ons section, click on node library, and then click enable screen transition. And you'll notice if you click over to the auto load here, that screen transition will be automatically added to your auto loads. And the screen transition auto load gives you a couple of things. 
So it allows you to set a transition color for the transition to the next screen. Transition texture, which is a grayscale texture that represents what the pattern looks like. And you can say transition to scene. If you don't have a scene that you want to transition to, in other words, you want to manually determine what happens during the transition, you can just call the transition function and then use that in combination with the yield function. So you can yield and in here you will want to put your screen transition. So just like this and the transitioned halfway signal is available to notify you when you are ready to switch what's behind the screen transition. There's also a transitioned fully signal to let you know when it's fully over. So what does this look like in practice? Let's go ahead and run the test project. And if I click screen transition, you can see that I get a nice transition that takes me to a different scene. And then I can click back and it transitions again. And I've actually configured this to randomize each time you click the button so you can see all of the different ways that it can be applied. By default, the transition texture looks like this. It's a simple gradient from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. It's a grayscale gradient. And this is how all of the textures should look. And I've actually included a couple of example textures. So here is a sort of dithered texture. And then here is a radial texture. So this will create a circle and this will create sort of like a growing dots kind of look. So again, you can check out this example project. Look at how all of the code is structured, how all of these buttons work in here. And I hope that those add-ons are useful for you to use in your own projects. I'll be using all of these most likely in my entry for the Ludum Dare Jam 51. So that's it. Again, the repository is Firebelly slash Godot add-ons on GitHub. Let me know if it helps and I will see you in the next video. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and subscribe. If you want to learn how to build a 2D platformer in the Godot engine, check out my Udemy course, link in the description. If you want to support my work, you can pick up one of my games on Steam or itch.io, links in the description as well.